when someone accidentally threw away the school play costumes. Oh, no. Replacements were shipped with FedEx. And with picture proof of delivery, everyone could focus on the perfect opening night. FedEx, where now meets next. For residential delivery only. The holidays are coming. Find a gift for someone special with jewelry from Blue Nile. Right now, Blue Nile is offering special Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals. Save up to 50% on the season's most stunning trends. Blue Nile offers an endless selection of bold gold styles, gemstone jewelry, and classic diamond pieces. And now, for a limited time, get 36 months special financing on minimum purchases of $1,000. Restrictions apply. See BlueNile.com for details. That's BlueNile.com. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. Hello and welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello, everyone. Today's guest is the award-winning sporting photographer, Tom Shaw, who has just finished a personal project of photographing the black cricketers to play cricket for England. Hello, Tom. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. And how are you? Yeah, I'm very good. And uh, just speaking off air, you're close to where the Lewis Racecourse used to be. That's right, yeah. I moved down to Lewis about five years ago now and uh, we back on to sort of what's part of the gallops and you can just see uh, in the morning some of the horses doing the gallops from the the yards up there and then uh, you can head out the back of the house and walk up to the old race course it's great a nice place to live then yes very yeah very nice yeah very good now you worked with the England cricket team I believe between 2000 and 2014 how did you come um, about this personal project for the for the for the black cricketers, uh, it was <laughs> it was kind of a lack of work, a lack of something to do, uh, and looking for a project really. So whilst uh, all work stopped around about March uh, that year and um, in twenty twenty, and it kind of dawned on me that yeah, you know, I need to keep busy and, and doing things, and it was a really good job, good opportunity to sort of reevaluate where what I'd done in the past where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. And I've kind of moved away. I, I've photographed England cricket since 2000. Um, my first tour was actually 99 or 98 to Bangladesh and then Australia, West Indies in 99. Uh, and so touring and live cricket had been part of my life. So I kind of wanted to do things differently. And I've always been kind of moving away from the live aspect of sport. Um, and, and I thought I did a project on about 2005 of England's former captains. And then in sort of that summer of 2020 with Black Lives Matter, it kind of dawned on me that I hadn't really photographed any of the black players. I'd got to know Mark Butcher quite well and Alex Tudor from toying with them. And it started me to research how many black players had played for England. And I was really surprised that only 21 in all formats of the game, men's and women's, that it was so few. So I'd, um, I'd been working with Ebony, for Nat West I did some work for Nat West and uh, so I just chatted to her briefly and she said yeah she'd totally go and do that um, go and search them all out find them and um, photograph them so yeah for the last year I still haven't finished it's been well uh, Roland living in Barbados has been a slight um, a, a nice hiccup to have uh, and I need to head out there at some point to go and photograph him but yeah it's um, it was a, a personal piece of work really that I just wanted to do to keep me busy and to keep me engaged and keep me doing something. Yeah. Well, you'll look forward to your trip to see Roland, who's been a regular guest on the paddock and the pavilion. But how did you go about organising the, the various photographs that you had to, had to do? Uh, well, I, uh, in, in that sense, it was quite the, the easiest part was uh, just speaking to Butch. So I toured with Butch on a couple of times and Alex Tudor. So they were the two to get in touch with first. So I, I, drop them both the line and they were, yeah, come along. So I sh- I'd photograph them first. And then having a chat with Butch, he's still in touch with quite a lot of the other players. So he furnished me with a couple of numbers and sent a couple of text messages. And then it was just a case of just sort of um, 
you know, seeing when and where and when it was safe to go and do so. So I kind of photographed them all outside. I wanted to use natural light only rather than sort of being burdened down with all the sort of the kit that you normally take, lots of lights and lots of things. I really wanted to strip everything back to keep it a lot more basic. Now, I started off shooting it on film uh, on a large format camera, just the look and the feel of it kind of felt right. And I had time to go back and process the film. So I'd spend my evenings just processing film. Um, but latterly it's kind of taken over by digital due to time. Um, now I'm back working again and the quality of some of the new digital cameras and the file sizes are huge and the details amazing. So it's kind of on a par with the film stuff. So yeah, it was really butch was the, um, a real catalyst for it. So um it was a great help in sort of cajoling me because I hadn't met or most of them or, or worked with any of them. Uh, the other good help was Mike Selvey, former Middlesex and England player who I toured with. He was a, a journalist at the Guardian, lovely man. And he'd obviously played with five, four of them who played for Middlesex and England in the eighties. And uh, yeah, he was a great help with it. And he suggested, you know, why are you, I, it started off as being just test cricketers really. Um, but he said, well, why are you making that distinction between test? It, you know, to play for England, you have to go through the same journey, no matter what form of cricket you play. And I kind of thought, yeah, well, you know, it, we often do this. We don't often, and a lot of players sometimes feel, or oh, they're not proper cricketers because they have, haven't have played test matches, but I, I don't think so. And Andrew Strauss recognised this when they, um, when they honoured all the former England players. He said, no, no, if you play for England, you have been through exactly the same journey uh, and dedication to get to that way. And I, I totally feel that way. So, yeah, yeah they're, all, included. they're all internationals, aren't they? And how, yeah, how did you, yeah, to play international cricket is phenomenal. <laughs> it's such such a hard thing to do. So, yeah. And how did you decide where to take the photos? I noticed quite a few of them have got the sight screen in the, in the background. Yeah, I was doing something that's repeatable uh, and, and something that's easy to do and a quiet location. And I kind of wanted to take them back to... Uh, either they were a sort of a local cricket ground near them because uh, there's uh, something really quite appealing about the old site screens and it creates a um it creates something that, that is that, that it's in all grounds and there's all sorts of bits there some of them aren't done against there because it hasn't quite worked they've not looked right but i really wanted to use kind of a, as a metaphor for visibility you know use a site screen anything in front of the site so you can see better to sort of highlight that these you know, to get these people more front and centre, as it were, and to highlight that, you know, there's only been 21 of them and to, to celebrate their achievements, really. So it's really sort of about trying to bring them to the front and say, look, it's kind of a nice, they're nice textures and colours to it. And uh, yeah, so it's really, that was the starting point. It didn't always work that way. And I felt that sometimes having a black background um worked really well certainly with one of the pictures uh, a couple of the pictures work brilliantly by keeping it sort of on the dark side so and which is why it's all in black and white because i was shooting it on film and i could process it at home so it's a real sort of the theory but there's no other theory behind it apart from i wanted to go back to basics really uh, and to shoot shoot it um in its simplest form really and how long does, does it take to to take each photo how long preparation and time when you're actually there I mean, not long, really. I like to get there sort of half an hour before I've asked them to arrive and then just go around and look for a couple of spots that you think the light's right. It's the light really that makes it, the light and the background and just seeing what's possible and what works. Uh, and then from there, it's only about 20 minutes, half an hour to shoot, to shoot the pictures that I'm after. But it doesn't really take long. So, um, uh, yeah, I like to work quickly. Having worked with sports people, uh, for 20 years, I've realised you can't take your time. But uh, anything more than about 20 minutes, I think both parties are starting to lose interest a little, little bit. So. And you've just got just got Roland and that uh, lovely trip to Barbados left to, to take. Yeah, I, but there's also Neil Williams. Now, uh, I've spoken to Sells about, um, about those two who had ceased. I can't remember the other chaps. No, Wolf Slack. Yeah, Wolf Slack and Neil Williams. Wolf Slack and Neil away. Williams. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I wanted to represent them somehow. So I wanted to sort of get them in, in into the picture somehow. So um, now Wolf Slack, I got some details of Wolf's sister and I spoke to her and she had a whole box of his old memorabilia. and all that. So we found one of his uh, old test jumpers, which I'd photographed that. And um, for Wolf, it's been really, um, for Wolf, sorry, for Neil, it's been really difficult to find anything 
um, or any details of any of his family um, since he passed away. He's got two sons over in St. Vincent, I think. But uh, I can't seem to find uh, anything. So I don't know what, what items will be around. And um, I did have, a, I did email. Um, he took, he only played one test, but he took his wickets at, in the same test that Atherton took a wicket. So on the off chance, I emailed Atherton to say, did you keep that ball for when you took a wicket? And he completely didn't. And it was at the Oval, I think. The Oval don't really have any memorabilia like Lords do, thinking that they might have, oh, this is the ball from that series and or something to have a tangible link to him. But, found it. but the ECB have, kind, have made up his test cap. They made test caps for all the players um, sort of engraved with their with their time, uh, you know, um, when they made their debut and whatnot. So I need to photograph that as, as his item. And there is a third player who is not represented at all because he didn't want to be part of it, which was Michael Carberry. So for, for, for various reasons, he just felt he didn't want to be involved. He didn't want to see it as a thing that could really help or make any kind of change. So I had a good long chat with him. And there's reasons pretty sound of being involved. I totally respect that. I can't force anyone to become part of it. But, uh, yeah, so he, he doesn't doesn't appear in it at all. Uh, yeah, and you, you took a photo of um, Joey Benjamin, who sadly passed away yeah, in March I did, 2021. Yeah. Yeah, we were probably about five months before that. I uh, met him at uh, in Reigate, uh, where he was he'd been working, and uh, yeah, he seemed he was looking forward to getting back into doing more cricket and to doing more coaching and fitness and whatnot. And he was in seemed to be in fine fettle then, but it's just very sad to hear that yeah, that he'd passed away. And you're hoping to have a, an exhibition at Lords sometime next year? Yeah, I mean, this is something Lords have approached me. I didn't go certainly looking for Lords to do this and I've I've worked with Lords for a lot of a lot of times a lot of things with the MCC and um, have a good relationship with them and, the, and the, the museum's been shut for a while due to the COVID but they're back up and running and so possibly this time next year we're going to be having uh, putting them into the museum and they're doing a whole piece on black on um, black Indians black cricketers so it's kind of a fitting it kind of works perfectly in with what they want to do so we're going to get yeah going to get some printed up big and get them all displayed up in there well, that'll be special, and and even if it can go to other grounds around the country as well. Yeah, happy for it to do that. I yet to sort of see see the the, the sort of the reach uh, and extent of it. Be be great. Uh, you know, it's 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 just be good to sort of highlight that. I mean, there's a generation of cricketers, a generation of kids now growing up is probably you know with Joffre and CJ playing. There's been very few, especially in the test arena. You know, Michael Carberry and beyond that was Butcher and Tudor. So in the twentieth, twenty first century. There's I think I'm right saying only five. I think it's only five, I think, in this century. Yeah, yeah. played tests. And, and the number of tests played, uh, yeah, it's, you know, there should be more. There should be a lot more. And hopefully it's going to inspire a generation um, to, to sort of just go, yes, there, you know, there are there are other players like me. I mean, it's sad that Joffre's injured and CJ, I mean, he's done a couple of tests. I don't know what he's, it'd be great to see him back here. He's a remarkable fielder as well. Um, what what's you know who where are the next you know the next players coming from? Well, both Chris Jordan and Tom Mills are in the T uh, twenty. Oh yeah, Tom World Mills, yes, sport. yeah, because yeah. yeah, he, he's only played one T uh, twenties, I think T twenty twenties, yeah, yeah, and so yeah, and he's you know he's a, a so, you know being such great players for Sussex as well. So uh, hopefully they can uh, yeah because they're off to the World Cup, aren't they? Very soon, so very soon. Yeah. Leave today, actually, I think. Yeah, that's right. First game against the West Indies on the twenty third of October. And also we've got, um, you've mentioned her already in the podcast, um, uh, Ebony Rainford-Brent's excellent ACE programme, which hopefully will lead to more uh, young black players uh, representing Surrey and other counties and providing role mod- models for the future. Well, yeah, I hope so. So, so it's funny you mentioned that because I did some work. So Royal London have given them a, a significant amount of money to expand the programme. And I was doing some work for Royal London with them and I got speaking to Chevy, who runs the programme up there with for, for Ebony. And um, so I'm up there going to do some portraits of these youngsters as a sort of counter to, to, to the players that have played. This is the next generation. So they've got, uh, they've got the ones in, at the Oval. So I'm going to the Oval uh, this week, going to do some more portrait work. And then there's Bristol, there's Birmingham. So hopefully, and they're, they're pretty confident there's a couple of, couple of players there who could hopefully push on 
and go and make it to the top. So it'd be great to see them and it'd be great to follow their journey as well. So that hopefully they can, you know, start to make, start to hopefully make a difference and start to, you know, bring more people into this great game. Yeah, I think role models are very important to, uh, in this, this, yeah. this day and age as well. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we were, my wife's Australian, I'd met her on an Ashes tour. We, we go back to Adelaide quite a lot. And we went to see the Adelaide Strikers two or three times. It was really cheap to go and watch it there. It's a great big stadium. And uh, the, the kids want to be Rashid Khan because they think he's amazing. And he is great. And then he comes to Sussex and we you know, have to go and watch him at Sussex. And it's great that kids can have a role model. It, you know, it can be absolutely anyone. They just, they are fixated by it. You look at Ronaldo, look at the number of shirts, and just to see great players. And it, people like them. They want to see people like them doing well. Uh, and it does. It does really make a difference. So hopefully we can get more, you know, more and more people on, you know, watching onto the game and saying, you know, and making it more inclusive. And the photographs are also linked to Mark's, you, you guys are history documentary. Yes. Yeah. So Mark was doing the documentary with Sky. So it's a Sky production. And the producer, uh, he mentioned to the producer that, um, that I'd done, that I'd been working on the portraits and they got in touch and said, you know, they'd like to use them as part of the clothing thing. So we'd, uh, we were working together on sort of getting that finished. Uh, so it was great because we worked together on the last couple, which was CJ and Joffre, and they had to go and film them and do it. And yeah, it's 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 it was it's shocking. That, that, I mean, I urge anyone who hadn't seen it to go and see it. It really is eye-opening. The things I hadn't heard, I'd heard some of the stories from the players that I'd been with, hadn't heard all the stories. And even now, I was back with I saw Monty Lynch on another shoot and we were just having a chat and whatnot. And he, there's more stuff that he's, you know, people have said to him, it's just shocking that 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 kind of thing goes on, you know, even, you know, 2010, that's probably 30 years ago now, but it's, you know, it's grim. It really is grim to see that that's still going on. Yeah. What some of the players had to overcome to achieve what they achieved. Yeah. And how many, and how many players probably gave up because of all of that? How many players we lost to the game? by not being made to feel welcome, you know, in probably all forms. And it's kind of, uh, you know, how long can you put up with that? I mean, those kind of comments chipping away at you constantly, constantly. It must be horrendous. And, you know, we've got to hear their stories, you know, sort of people like myself empathising with it is one thing. But hearing their stories, you know, how many other people, and certainly all the, the, all the stuff at Yorkshire, I think there was, a, there was an article recently about a couple of young black players who just said, or they might have been Asian players, and as I said, that they just got too much from just the constant. It's just better off out of it, which is wrong. It's wrong in every way. It's just so, so bad. Well, thank you for that, talking about uh, your personal project. Just moving on to your photographic career, um, mm. what first attracted you to becoming a photographer? Oh, that's a good... Uh, <laughs> um, it, what, getting, I think getting a camera when I was a kid uh, now we spent half of my life in Sussex and when we were sort of 11, 12, moved up to Scotland. Um, my mum's from Scotland. We used to holiday all the time. Uh, and I fell in with a really good group of lads who, uh, when I, you know, 12 years old, is quite a difficult time to move. I didn't find it that difficult. It was quite like a big adventure moving up to Scotland. And, um, the sort of the lads I fell in with were really into the outdoors and we used to go walking and climbing, but they're all really arty ones. Uh, one was an illustrator, it's one who was doing sculpture, one now makes uh, visual effects and whatnot. And we just used to hang around the art class all the time. But I was really rubbish at every single form of art, except I loved taking pictures. And then uh, <laughs> the art teacher, unknown to me, there was a dark room in the, um, in, in the, in the school. And I was, it was just opened up a whole new world. As soon as I found out there was a dark room, I was, it just took hold of me and I just wanted to just go and shoot pictures uh, essentially just landscapes so it was kind of a weird thing I wanted to just shoot landscapes in Scotland and print them and do that I was a be all and end all of my world as being outside and doing all that but anyway as kind of life takes on you kind of I knew from the very beginning I didn't want to work inside I've got to be outside I hate being inside I hate computers I hate sitting at a desk and I just had to be outside and it just seemed to be I did a degree in archaeology but I wasn't as keen on it as others. I loved it. But again, it was outside. But the photography was the bit that kept coming back to me until one day I just thought, I've got to be a photographer. I can't do anything else in this world. <laughs> it's the only thing I really want to do. 
And by chance, was it, I stumbled across a book of sports photos in, um, uh, in the bookshop. I was looking at the photography section, and I just opened it, looked at it, and went, that's got to be the best job in the world doing that. And another large slice of luck was that someone I played sport with at university, his brother worked at that agency, uh, which was all sport, which became Getty Images. So he put me in touch with him. I went to see him, had a chat with him, and I went to show my folio of what I had. And he introduced me to the big boss, the, the, uh, the guy that ran the whole business, who was himself a cricket photographer, Adrian Morell, who took the picture of Ian Botham in the dressing room with the cigar. Anyway, so Adrian looked at my folio and he said, yo, you've got potential. And that was enough for me to, you know, and I can't, just can't stress the importance of people in jobs. When you get young people coming through, just words of advice mean so much. His words, you've got potential, was enough to me to continue trying to break into an industry. Because I get to the point where I gave it a year. So I've got another year to sort of, I was working in a camera shop, wasn't really going anywhere. So I can't do this forever. I was 24, 25, thinking I've got to set, you know, and his words were enough to make me go, he thinks I've got potential. So that was it. I just, I phoned him every week for a year, <laughs> asking for a job. So eventually he gave me a job and that was it. And that was my in. And it, the job wasn't as a photographer, it was as an editor. So my job was to take the rolls of film from the photographers, go into a little room. So this will be at football matches, this will be at Wembley, or all manner of great big sport. You, you, it really was going into the deep end and uh, taking a roll of film, processing it, uh, drying it, then scanning it and capturing it. And, it. and that was it. That's got me into photography. And it just sort of looked on from there. Shows the difference, what you just said there about uh, a small thing where someone's giving you, uh, boosting you up, saying you've got potential from what we were speaking about two or three minutes ago when the opposite was being uh, mm. said to some young black cricketers you can see the effect then of absolutely the really. Abs yeah. absolutely just, just words that. of encouragement yeah words of encouragement for young people is so important there's a real thing in the photography industry about giving back because it is not it is quite an extraordinary job but without a doubt people do it for the absolute love of it and that you there's something deep down you know if you've got that but and it's in all professionals i don't think you'd make it a professional without that thing that that deep love of photography and caring about it and and any young photographer would cut you know if they come up it's just I'll always think back to that time is that just give back to what other people have given back to you at a time and, and you can see that in cricket i'd say you know that 90 percent of cricketers you know they do they love it is it's such an amazing sport that, you know, you always give back. And I'll, you know, you take the kids down, just give back. And just relentless positivity is so worth it. It's so much better than, than people being criticising. Yeah. I mean, he could have said anything. He did say it was quite, you know, it was a, a well-laid out poem. He goes, it shows you care. And he just saw the bits in me that probably were the foundation for making it work. I wasn't the finished article. And, um, you know, you see that in young cricketers. They're not the finished article, but... If you see the right bits, the right attitude needs to be encouraged. And how did you get then to work for the England cricket team on tour? Uh, it, well, it, I've got a bit of a confession. Is that at age 23, I hated cricket. I hated everything about it. I, my dad was, loved it. My brother loved it. And I used to go down and play cricket. But when we were kids in the early 80s, uh, did you ever play cricket as a kid in the 80s? Most people know, you know, it's not softball. It's not plastic bats. It is a hard ball from the off. And, uh, and I, you know, when other kids are better at bowling, it was horrible. I hated everything about it. And I never had any interest in cricket. It just did not feature on my radar. But after university and after joining all sport, I wanted to travel. Travel was the big thing. I just wanted to see the world and uh, i hadn't really seen much of the rest of europe let alone the world and uh, they said oh do you want to get to bangladesh for to edit to do the processing thing again for the world t oh it's called the mini world cup in bangladesh 98 the forerunner forerunner of the champions trophy and i was like yeah i'd love to go to bangladesh and i thought oh it's cricket it's a bit boring but i'll go because i uh, and then prior to that i'd worked in formula one now, I don't know if you've got any experience of Formula One, but it's possibly full of some of the worst people I've ever met in my life. 
not genuinely bad people, but just people who I've got no interest in fast cars and fancy watches and supermodels. It's just not on my radar. And, you know, people just kind of look you, look you up and down a bit to go, oh, you, you know, you're not very expensive trainers. And I've just finished being a student. I just found it really hard. I found it really hard. It just nothing appealed to me about it. And it still doesn't. And then I got onto the lift. I think it was Adam Holyoke. And he introduced himself to me. And I kind of think, that's mad how uh, that he hadn't, you know, oh, I've not seen you on tour, I'm Adam, nice to meet you and whatnot. And he was captaining that series, I think. And I was like, I was genuinely gobsmacked thinking, uh, you know, an England captain who's captain that uh, has sort of spoken to you and sort of reached out to you. And that was it. It was just, it was the people that drew me into it. And you kind of think, you know, these people are great. And I was looking at the time, there was three or four other photographers photographing England and they'd just come back from an Ashes tour. They'd been to the West Indies and had a great time. I'd done the West Indies trip. Oh, no, sorry. Um, I'm doing that. After going to Bangladesh, they said to me, do you want to go to the West Indies now to edit on that Australia-West Indies? Now, I hadn't been to a test match ever. And the first test series I ever did was Australia-West Indies. West Indies-Australia. Um, it was four test matches and it was 2-2. It was the best, one of the best test series ever. And that, I don't know if you remember the match with Lara. They needed about 180 with the last two wickets against Australia. And it was Lara shepherding the strike off Walter and Ambrose for three hours. The tensest cricket you've ever felt for what felt like an eternity. You know, those last five minutes of a football match, but that stretched out for three hours. And it was Glorious watching Australia get beaten, but by Lara in we were in Barbados. The crowd it was just it was brilliant. It was mayhem. It was bedlam. There was just you know drinks going over. It was fantastic. And you kind of then at that point I went, cricket is amazing. What a great sport! How you can build that tension. You can go from you know you swings this way that way. The series was great. Uh, it was good times for me. And I just fell in love with the sport and the, the whole traveling the world and whatnot. And I just thought that I want to do more of this. And um, as, a, as it happened, the guy who was doing a lot of the England stuff at the time, Lawrence, who, you know, he's still working for Getty, good friend. And he wanted to, he'd done his time touring. He'd settling down. He was having kids. And I just said, I'll go to Pakistan. And, and that was it. England had come off the back of a good run of South Africa, Australia, West Indies, good places to tour. And they were going back to the subcontinent. It was Pakistan. And Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, Lanka. yeah, that series. And then after that, it was going to be India. And um, and sort of the, I I just couldn't wait to go. And we had a great time in Pakistan. It was a brilliant place to tour. And I got to know Trez really well because I'd been to Southampton, Somerset, and I'd sat on the roof. And he came up to the roof to watch something. And we just got chatting on there. I said, oh, you, you know, I'm coming to Pakistan and you're going as well. And I got to know him. Uh, and then, yeah, it kind of took off from there. And no one else wanted to shoot cricket. And I just couldn't wait to go. So they happily say, you know, take it on. And uh, I take it on, I did, yeah. It was brilliant, great series. You know, to win in Pakistan in the dark, then to win in Sri Lanka. And we lost India. Then we went to New Zealand after that. And then, yeah, so it's so you've, good. You've, so just from there. You've been everywhere. So and you've been to... Australia, and you've um, photographed a successful Ashes home series. Yeah, that was. Four, yeah, yeah, I think after '05, I, I mean, that's when I won Sports uh, Specialist Sports Photographer of the Year with the set I had from that. That was kind of it, it. Felt like a natural progression to that point, but there was one thing I hadn't seen, and that was just winning Australia. Now, prior to going to Australia, I never. All I wanted to see was a good test match you know a good test match which made pictures you know Pakistan was really tough for pictures it was a batting it was lots of batting lots of batting it was never really there was no drama involved in it it was just it was fairly dull but you had some good series when you get a good test match you know and the Ashes 05 was some brilliant cricket but you go to you go to Australia and you know the time I wasn't prior to that prior to doing the first Ashes I wasn't bothered if England won or not as long as it made pictures and it was a good story but after that, you go to Australia, as soon as you get there, you want England to win so badly just because of all, all, the, all the crap you get from everyone. And it is proper rivalry. You think, oh, we can't lose to these people. And the one thing I was holding out for, I wanted to see us win in Australia. We used to get so much grief from all the other photographers. You turn up and you look at a 5-0 loss and it's like, oh, God. 
we're just getting so much grief. And so 2011 was just brilliant. You know, three, three wins in innings defeat is just brilliant. So much yeah. fun. It was, yeah, it was really rather good. special. I mean, yeah. I, I've I've been to Australia quite a lot, but I'm a, a victim of going to Perth on a regular basis. So I've seen five successive defeats in Perth. So even yeah, even in 2010, yeah. 11, when you managed to see England win the series, I still managed to see us lose in Perth. In Perth, yeah. <laughs> and even then, you losing in Perth, going, oh, we can't lose. Well, we were one up in Perth, weren't we? Yeah, we won up when we went there. Yeah, and yeah. then yeah, one up when we went there, and then it goes to one one, and then you're like, why? Is it? We can't lose this from here now. And then uh, that Melbourne, to when I think Australia, we'd made 509. I think I've got a picture of 599 on the board and Australia were 99 all out. <laughs> it's just remarkable. It's brilliant. You know, really stuck it to them. But yeah, so I live, that, that old adage of England only play cricket to beat Australia. <laughs> it's so true. It is so true. I just don't want to lose to them. Can't stand it. I'm not really emotionally invested in sport, but that's one thing that I just don't like us losing. Just got to beat them. And now I read that you're, you've moved in to take more pictures of nature rather than sport. Is that right? A little bit. I and mean, that's kind of um, sort of moved on. I'm kind of trying to bring a bit more of the sort of um, the landscape work. I, I do enjoy it, but whether financially it can make it work and there's enough in it to... Um, but sort of I'm trying to bring a bit of more of that into my work, really, sort of trying to sort of combine the two, which is obviously quite hard. But there's certain sort of bits and elements that I can bring into other projects that I've got that, you know, keep floating around and doing that. So, yeah, so sort of the natural world's really quite, it's quite key. And I'm certainly during the pandemic getting up into the hills around here in Lewis and the South Downs and stuff and just photographing and doing it. But uh, I, I still don't think my love of the sport stuff will diminish. Um, but it's trying to sort of um, bring them together a bit more, really. But you're still doing some sports photography. Yeah, yeah my, my commercial work. So I generally do less. I, I work for the ECB. We're doing lots of stuff on participation, on women's cricket um, and the kids' cricket with the dynamos uh, and whatnot. So still doing a lot of that. Uh, working, I like, did some stuff for Royal London. And prior to last, you know, last year I was doing Nat West. So I work with sponsors and brands and sort of getting them to to do um, where they kind of meet and to sort of enhance their, their um, sort of amplify their voice really. So yeah, I'm still working quite a lot in cricket really, which is great because I, I really feel I can't leave the thing. I've, so much of my life has been involved in it. That, and there's still so many great stories within cricket that I still want to sort of look at and pursue. So, And you're still hoping to go to the West Indies in 2022? Yeah, I want to go. Yeah, get to go back to uh, Barbados. I want to go, you know, to photograph Roland. And as you do, um, as you kind of look at it, you kind of think um, Australia are over there, uh, England are over there. I don't know what whether it's a test series or a. So I kind of if you tie that in, see if there's something, anything else I can do over there. And there was talk of going with another friend who photographs in Antigua quite a lot. At, in January, uh, he might need some help doing some rowing work over there so there's still lots of sport to be done and to be photographed so um yeah hopefully i can get over there one yeah, place to watch i think cricket. it's t- t20s in january i think and then the test matches are in march so it gives you plenty of opportunity to go and see yes. Roland in barbados i'm sure they'll have absolutely a test yeah they definitely should and uh but even if there's no cricket on it's still a great place to go so mm-hmm. it's just so i can uh, get logistics sorted and uh hopefully cost wise and hopefully covid won't be too much of a problem Right. Well, thank you very much um, for coming on the paddock and the pavilion and uh, also the best of luck for your personal project. Uh, We look forward to the uh, exhibition at Lords uh, next year and also um, best of luck when you're finding your way across to Barbados to say hi to Roland. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do. Look forward to catching up with him. I'm Thank sure you. he must know everybody on the island. I thought so. Be quite yeah, good. he's very he's very well connected, and now he's been doing yeah. some commentary work as well. So, and he's uh, he's been on this podcast a lot, and he's he's a great guy to chat to. Excellent. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Paddock and the Pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at the Pad and Pav. Podcast Network.
With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. <laughs> 